Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Great. Uh, well, I'd like to welcome everyone. My name is Susan Moffat, and I am the project director of the Global Urban Humanities Initiative. And this initiative looks at global cities through the lenses not only of architecture and city planning, but through methods from the arts and humanities. Uh, and I'm very thrilled to bring, be bringing uh, Richard Crum from Yale uh, to speak today, and we'll be hearing him lecture uh, about birds, and he will be in conversation uh, with UC Berkeley professor of architecture, Nicholas DeMancho. Uh, so this may require some explanation. Uh, why has a program on cities invited an ornithologist? And why pair him with an architect? Uh, well, one might ask, why would an architect like Professor DeMancho write a book about the development of the NASA spacesuit? Well, let's start with Nicholas's book, Spacesuit Fashioning Apollo, which chronicled the way that the Playtex company, maker of braziers and girdles, beat out the more mechanically, metallurgically oriented titans of the military industrial complex to design and build a spacesuit that could both protect the human body in space and allow it to move. Well, this actually has something to do with what Professor Crum describes as the co-evolutionary dance of desire and the object of desire in birds and humans. He'll explain today how this works in birds. In humans, he argues, all art is the result of a co-evolutionary historical process between audience and artist, a co-evolutionary dance between display and desire, expression and taste. So the mating choices of birds give us useful analogies to the evolution of human taste in the arts and fashion, which some people consider part of the human extended phenotype. In the case of the Playtex company, the aesthetics of Christian Dior's new look, which required structural foundations of architecturally elaborate girdles and braziers, required Playtex to develop the technology that later allowed it to create a functional spacesuit. Professor Crum explains a similar interaction of aesthetics and function in the evolution of birds. The reason that dinosaurs developed feathers with smooth, planar surfaces rather than just remaining fluffy down, he argues, might be that smooth feathers allowed the development of finely detailed colors and patterns that were pleasing to mates making reproductive choices. Eventually, these planar feathers became useful for flight. So, aesthetics engendered functional structure that allowed, that allowed flight in both man and bird. Professor Crumb's idea that the evaluation of aesthetics and the development of form are in a continual dance has been provocative to many scholars in the humanities. So that is why we are here today. And the connection to cities? Well, cities are the preeminent stage for the evolution of the human arts and the ongoing dance of design, evaluation, aesthetics, and function in an endlessly iterative process. Professor Crumb's interests include avian phylogenetics, behavioral evolution, evolution of avian plumage coloration, historical biogeography, avian mimicry, and the theropod dinosaur origin of birds. He has conducted field work throughout the Neotropics and Madagascar, and has studied fossil theropods in China. He is the recipient of MacArthur and Guggenheim Fellowships, among many other awards. And The Evolution of Beauty was named one of the 10 best books of 2017 by the New York Times. He is the William Robertson Co-Professor of Ornithology, Ecology, and Evolutionary Biology at Yale, Head Curator of Birdberg Zoology in the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History, and former director of the Frankie Program in Science and the Humanities. Please join me in welcoming Richard Crum. Thank you, Susan, and thank you all for coming. 
Uh, it's really been a pleasure to be here for uh, a day or so and to uh, uh, interact with so many interesting people. Um, I hope in a few minutes to complete this arc, uh, to fulfill the promise of connecting uh, the aesthetic lives of birds uh, to uh, urban humanities. Uh, but in order to do that, I, I gotta get going. Uh, I um, uh, have uh, uh, been a lifelong bird watcher. This is really an example of what I would uh, brag of as bird watching science, science informed by my experience of natural history of birds. Um, uh, but the more you know about biology and evolution, the more likely it is that you're going to disagree with what I have to say tonight. So I want to try to earn your credit uh, uh, and credibility by starting at the beginning uh, of, of, of my story. And that's, that's me uh, in, uh, in seventh grade. Uh, and uh, this picture is embarrassing for many reasons. But uh, of course, the glasses are the focus of both the picture and uh, this anecdote because um, the glasses uh, have a big part of my story. Uh, I got my first pair of glasses in fourth grade. The world uh, came into focus at that moment. And in just a few short months, I was a bird watcher. Uh, and uh, when you're a young kid and you start a life list, uh, that's the first thing you've ever done that you think is actually about your whole life. And it was that point that I uh, very soon realized that my life would revolve around an engagement with birds and that I would be now, still, uh, somehow engaged with birds. Of course, uh, I knew nothing about science or research, and indeed, when I got to undergrad, I thought that uh, I would become a, uh, uh, something like a park ranger, uh, uh, run a refuge. Uh, that's really the only thing I, I didn't know about research as a, as a thing. But uh, indeed, I, as an undergrad, I, I, I discovered that evolutionary biology was the area of science that was about what I found inherently fascinating, and, and I was hooked. So I, I um, engaged ultimately in a lot of bird watching science. So here I am in the 80s in grad school recording birds in the Andes. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and I've continued that research up through today. And here I am in my very messy office uh, at Yale where somehow or other productivity still happens amidst all that mess. Um, uh, I've, as, as Susan mentioned, I have the pleasure to work on lots of different pro uh, projects. Uh, and at this point, I can get as wacky as I want to be. It's all over the place, right? Uh, but, um, and I, for a long time, I thought that it's just um, weird stuff that Rick is into, and, and uh, you know, who needs a worldview? I'm having too much fun, right? But over the years, I realized, wow, that a lot of my, what I'm uh, interested in is revolving around a certain central topic, and that topic is uh, the evolution of beauty. And by beauty, I mean not beauty as it obviously occurs to me when I see this, this uh, banded katanga, or... Um, uh, uh, that motivates my science, uh, but beauty to the birds themselves and to the scientific uh, 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 idea that birds are beautiful because they are beautiful to themselves. That birds, through their social and sexual choices, are, uh, are agents in their own evolution. That the subjective experience of birds can feed back upon the evolution of populations and lineages over time. Right? So that's where we're headed. Uh, we're going to start with the birds, right, straight on. This is an image, uh, a videotape taken by my former student Ed Scholes, now at, uh, at Cornell. This is a, a, a display of a superb bird of paradise. And uh, this is an example of a polygynous bird. The female does all the nesting, all the work, and he displays in order to attract a female. And the female visits multiple males and chooses among them. And here we see an extraordinarily complex display. If you listen carefully, you can hear him snapping his wings. So we have this brilliant color, which is a, a photonic device, a nano a nanostructure that makes those colors. Recently, we've just described the, the black feathers around them are super black, creating an especially uh, 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 amazing contrast. Uh, basically, uh, use, exploiting the same sensory process as in uh, Velvet Elvis painting. Right? And, 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 and uh, so lots of stuff to study here. But now I want to introduce the big problem. Most of my colleagues in evolutionary biology, when they see that, they think that ornament in nature, like these sexual ornaments, has evolved because it communicates real objective information about mate quality that uh, the choosers need to know. 
And that what this does is take all of beauty in nature and subsume it into a kind of adaptive utility, just another way to get better and get ahead. Now somehow or other, the way in which I've connected my own experience um, as a bird watcher to evolutionary science in my career, I have been led to be interested and fascinated for a very long time in, an, in another idea. The idea that, uh, that these are, are not communicating information, but evolving because they are uh, what I would refer to as merely beautiful. And this has led me through a lot of different research. Now, uh, so what I want to open up is talk about this, uh, this, this area of aesthetic evolution. Now, in this case, uh, the subjective experiences of animals, the flow of what it is like to be a bat or a mole or a more mirrored fish, uh, becomes the center of our science. Not something we explain away, but something we recognize as, as, uh, as, uh, as a source of agency for the animals themselves. So, of course, the, uh, the bat and the mole and the more mirrored fish have very different sensory world, what the early ethologists called an umbel, right? The sensory uh, experience. The more mirrored fish, for example, uh, senses the world with electrical fields and then actually sings electrical songs that vary in frequency and in tempo, like music, but in an entirely different kind of way that's insensible to us. These are, uh, are otherworldly kinds of experiences, right? Uh, they are other sources of the aesthetic, I think. Um, but of course, the bird uh, communicates in sensory modalities that are very familiar to us, uh, 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 vision, predominantly vision, color vision, and, and acoustics. And so, uh, as a young kid in southern Vermont, uh, uh, I never had the opportunity to think about uh, studying more mirrors <laughs> or moles, or, and the, the birds were suddenly salient, and I ended up as an ornithologist. But, um, so, here I want to uh, propose that aesthetic evolution is an emergent consequence of sensory perception, cognitive evaluation, and choice. And so that includes the uh, all of these kinds of examples from the natural world, not just uh, not just um, uh, uh, sexual uh, ornaments like the wood thrush song or the cock of the rock, but social ornaments like the blue jay, uh, baby bird mouths, and even other kinds of ornamental st structures in nature like like flowers. Um, so whenever these three things happen on a heritable substrate, uh, either genetically or culturally, we can create we see what I think is a different mode of evolution. And with the subjectivity of the animal becomes an active in interacting with that population. Um, in order to bring beauty back into the sciences, I need an explicit scientific perspective. And I say that beauty is not just merely attraction. Uh, every, actually, in aesthetics, everyone from Kant on has had to differentiate uh, uh, mere pleasure from some special quality of beauty. And, uh, and I do as well. And I say beauty is not merely attraction or, 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 or positive uh, relation. It is a co-evolved attraction in which the form of desire and the object of desire shape one another over time, right? And this interaction, that interaction being uh, choice and, 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 and heritability. So these are not a new perspective. Indeed, it goes straight back to Darwin, who, uh, 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 after the origin of species, had lots of intractable problems, uh, no theory of genetics, no articulated ideas about where humans evolved, and, and as he called it, no theory of impracticable beauty. So he wrote to Asa Gray, soon after the origin, an ardent supporter of his new theory of adaptation by natural selection, that the sight of a feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze at it, makes me sick. And I think you will agree that Darwin looks a little sick in this <laughs> famous picture. In fact, Darwin was a sickly guy. I think he, uh, we would refer to him now as a somaticizer. He took his personal and, and intellectual problems and turned them into a great deal of stomach ailments over, over, over the year. But, um, uh, he was really a revolutionary man in a very, very conservative uh, suit and environment, right? And, uh, uh, and instead of sticking to uh, what is doubtless the most famous discovery, intellectual discovery of the 19th century, adaptation by natural selection, he wheeled around in a very foxy way and proposed another evolutionary mechanism, which he called sexual selection. It included both uh, uh, combat within a sex that gave rise to large body size like antlers and other, and mate choice, which gave rise to Ornament. So here is the, in the Descent of Man, he proposed this idea, and here he described mate choice using explicitly aesthetic language uh, of, of taste and, and, and art. So he described mate choice, the, the, the criteria by which animals choose their mates, as an aesthetic faculty, a taste for the beautiful, as standards of beauty. And he described uh, the most refined beauty may serve as a sexual ch 
charm and for no other purpose. And here he's outlining explicitly that he sees that sexual selection is a different kind of selection than natural selection. So for no other purpose means no other adaptive uh, or, or other function. Uh, his theory was explicitly co-evolutionary. So here we have, in a, in a passage about the Argus pheasant, who we'll meet in a few minutes, uh, the male Argus acquired his being gradually through time, through the preference of females during many generations, for the more highly ornate men and males. The aesthetic capacity of females advanced through exercise of habit, just as our own taste is gradually improved. So uh, um, this is a little vague, but of course, for some of you who didn't have any idea about the genetics, it's actually equivalent to the kind of descriptions of adaptation, which are now thought to be brilliantly prescient or, or, or forward thinking. So uh, Darwin's theory of uh, male-male competition was a, uh, a huge success. The idea that the struggle of, of by males for control over female reproduction was so congruent, I believe, with Victorian uh, culture that it was a big winner. And I think it actually contributed to the idea of, of evolution as an explanation of the, of, of the world. Right? However, his idea of mate choice, particularly female mate choice, was a big loser. Right? It was uh, criticized uh, relentlessly and actually driven from science for almost a century, uh, to the very margins uh, of it. His biggest critic uh, was Alfred Russell Wallace, the most effective critic, uh, and, and, and we'll focus on, on, on his. In, in uh, Wallace said many nutty things uh, that I'll skip, but he, he was a, when he was forced to admit uh, that things like peacock tail, an elaborate uh, a display uh, integrated with behavior, uh, that um, um, that, that, that ornament did exist. And he said, the only way in which we can account for the observed facts is by supposing that color and ornament are strictly correlated with health, vigor, and general fitness to survive. And this is ironic because Wallace has come to us today, in, in most evolutionary biologists believe that Wallace was the guy who killed sexual selection. His critique was so effective that sexual selection basically uh, was, uh, was, uh, was drummed out. And here he is articulating what I uh, have described as the prominent central idea of modern sexual selection, which is that it's about uh, information uh, about, about uh, the quality, objective quality of the mate, right? So indeed, um, uh, the reason how he resolved this was that he took the elements that, uh, of Darwin's theory like this that he liked, and he said, these are merely natural selection. So we no longer need the term sexual selection. That's why this passage is called natural selection, neutralizing sexual selection. So um, uh, uh, Darwin uh, uh, and Wallace fought about this for the rest of Darwin's life. Uh, Darwin died in 1883, uh, and Wallace lived until the dawn of World War I. So uh, a huge dominant influence on, um, on evolution. Now just a few years after uh, Darwin's death, Wallace wrote the book Darwinism, uh, which was, uh, 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 had a strong impact on, on projecting that word into the culture, even. And he said in the, in the introduction, even in rejecting that phase of sexual selection depending on female choice, I insist upon the greater efficacy of natural selection. This is preeminently the Darwinian doctrine, and I therefore claim uh, for my book the position of being the advocate of pure Darwinism. So here's Darwin's been dead for six years. And Wallace is claiming to be more Darwinian than Darwin. <laughs> now it's 130, 40 odd years uh, uh, after, and I'm still pissed. <laughs> and I hope that you will be too. Because in fact, uh, this is the beginning of the transformation of evolutionary biology. The beginning of uh, the field of the period of adaptationism. The idea of adaptation as a strong force that dominates all the important issues, which has been a big problem and, and part of the the, the, um, the broader intellectual issue of the book. Um, so, although Wallace lost, I think appropriately so, lost credit for the uh, uh, inventing the idea of adaptation by natural selection, he actually won the war over what evolutionary biology would become in the 20th century, which is a field simplified and dominated by the perspective of adaptationism, right? um, which was a field, again, without much space for this. Now, um, in a more academic seminar, I would, right at this point, uh, go into detailing modern versions of the Wallacean and the Darwinian views of sexual selection uh, with population genetics. I'm going to spare you all that. Uh, but I hope to give you an idea that you can take home and describe to uh, 
friend in the morning at, at work or, uh, or over breakfast table, uh, what did the guy say? Well, uh, I want to compare the value of beauty to the value of money. Where did these values come from? <coughs> they arise as a way of uh, uh, highlighting the difference between Wallacean and, 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 and Darwinian view. So um, uh, the value of money originally, the dollar, uh, came because we were on the gold standard. So every dollar had value because it stood in lieu of a tiny piece of gold in Fort Knox, right? Uh, and if you were skeptical about that, you could actually turn in your dollars for gold, right? And that's because you could, nobody would. And so the, the dollar had value because of gold. In this case, the value of the dollar is extrinsic to the dollars outside of the dollar, right? Uh, but then we're no longer on the gold standard. In fact, there is no currency on the planet that is any longer on the gold standard. Right? From dollars to Bitcoin, uh, where does the value of money come from? It is now, in Samuelson's memorable phrase, a social contrivance. It, come, it arises because we share uh, some opinion that money has value. Right? Uh, and um, and uh, the, what I, I'll skip over here, uh, in a little footnote, are all the papers, uh, by, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the biology of showing how this social contrivance occurs in a genetic system. In fact, in modern money, the value of money is intrinsic. There is no, there is no gold, right? And so, so uh, um, it, by analogy, uh, my evolutionary colleagues believe that the beauty in nature, sexual beauty, evolves because it's about some extrinsic benefit. And that extrinsic benefit is good genes, or no sexually transmitted diseases, direct benefits, uh, other things. It is about the goal. And the Darwinian and Fisherian view uh, is really that uh, beauty is its own value, right? And that is uh, the gold standard. Now, um, you know, it's not hard to go and find uh, uh, hysterical gold bugs uh, around today, right? These are people that think that leaving the gold standard was an irrational flight from reason. And that irrational argument is exactly the kind of tenor that you encounter in evolutionary biology when you propose leaving the gold standard. Uh, my evolutionary colleagues are gold bugs, right? They, 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 they feel uh, that the, the meaning of, of uh, in truth, the meaning of these ornaments has been, and of their research programs is undermined by the idea that there might not be any gold, right? So in the book, I uh, uh, rebrand this lack of the gold standard. I call it uh, beauty happens. Right? Uh, that's my new, my new model for the fisher Wendy uh, uh, equilibrium. Uh, anyway, uh, that, 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 that uh, in uh, this process of social contrivance will arrive at beauty regardless of adaptation. And, um, and how do we progress? How do we decide who's, uh, whether the Wallacean and the Darwinian are dominant in the world? Uh, well, one way to do that is uh, uh, through investigation. Uh, the way it works now is if people uh, look at ornaments and they try to find out whether, uh, most of my colleagues will, will try to look for the gold. They'll, they'll, they'll look for this value. If they don't find it, that means they haven't worked hard enough to find it. Right? And they never rejected this idea. So as a result, the history, the literature is filled with confirmation of the model. You know, oh yes, we found good genes, or we found uh, this uh, direct benefit. Um, uh, but they never uh, admit when, uh, when it hasn't been found. So what that means is that uh, in order to progress, we need to recognize that beauty happens as the null model. Now, uh, I'm just going to unpack it by saying uh, that gold bugs, uh, like uh, Russell Wallace here, are like leprechauns, promising that at the, every ornament is like a rainbow, leading to a pot of extrinsic gold. And your job is to find that. And you have to have faith that it's in there. Well, I'd ask yourself, if a leprechaun comes to you and says, hey, there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, uh, you're, what's your right response? Your response should be, show me the money. Right? <laughs> the burden of proof is on the leprechaun. Right? And that's what it means to say that beauty happens is the null model. In the absence of evidence in support of, of honest signaling, it doesn't mean we have worked hard enough to find it. It means that we have uh, uh, support for, uh, for, this, um, for this, this process. Back to the birds. How does this interact in the lives of birds? Well, this is an extraordinary uh, uh, ornamental species. This is the Argus pheasant, great Argus, which lives in, in Indonesia. The male is about six feet long. He would be, uh, he'd almost, he'd just about fit on the table here. He was standing there. Uh, this is taken in a zoo in Indonesia because it's a very rare bird. And that's the female. As you see in a moment, the male had a very long tail. 
But, uh, but he, in a moment, you'll see that most of his display is made up of his wing feathers, which are also quite long. He does some introductory uh, displays, and in a moment, he will be transformed in a really otherworldly way. Here, he, his, his, uh, it was uh, uh, compared by an early 20th century ethologist to something like a, bro a blown out umbrella, right? And it, it inverts his wings, and these secondary feathers, which attach to his ulna, are nearly three feet long. And on them are a bunch of spots. Well, the spots have a special quality. They have a, a white highlight on the top and a dark sort of smudge below, which gives them the impression of three-dimensionality. Right? And actually, they're held up so that uh, it looks like light is coming down and hitting a golden orb and creating that object. And there's 300 of them rotating there. Right? Now, uh, Darwin uh, argued about this, right? And talked in great detail about the development and possible evolution of these eye spots, right? But if, for our case, what we need to know is that what it shows is that behind every elaborate ornament in nature, there's an equally elaborate, co-evolved, subjective criterion for evaluating beauty. So although the female seems inert, she's actually the agent, right? And we should really uh, think of her as like a, um, uh, an, an elite collector in a gallery. They're not going to fall down weeping at how beautiful they are. Just like, huh. Right? And indeed, if you, if, you, if you look at these species, the sexual success is like the income distribution in America today. That is, the top 1 or 5% of the males get 50% of the copulations. The next 10, 20% of the males are getting most of the remainder. And then 50% of the males will probably never mate in their lives. Ex aesthetic extremity comes from this ex extrinsicity of selection and extremity of failure. So, uh, so her, 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 uh, she's really a connoisseur, and, and that, is, I, I mean, that in, in an evolved sense, right? So, so if we look at those details in, in, in the feather, we see this excruciatingly detailed uh, display. And actually, I've done a lot of work on the mathematical models of the development of within feather pigmentation patterns, and this is a pattern that we cannot create uh, yet with, 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 uh, you know, Turing patterns or other kinds of. Uh, mathematical mathematical model. So it's a it's a it's a it's a it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing. Now uh, this is a kind of optical illusion, which implies that the subjectivity of the receiver is is being encountered in a special way, a way that can't be explained by availability of information. Right. Um, however, there's kind of two levels to this. One is that the uh, 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 if we look at the, the the feather on the on the left, we can see that the size of the of the balls. Uh, 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 scales with the, with the size of the feathers. As the feather gets bigger toward the tip, the, 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 the spheres get larger. But if you look at it foreshortened from the perspective of the female, where the, the, the base of the tail is closer to her eye than the ones that are suspended over her head, you see that they converge on 300 golden balls of the same size. Right? So there's a forced, a, forced, uh, a forced perspective illusion. But this is like a double optical illusion. And, and this is the kind of thing that I think is a, a a, a, an unbelievable challenge to the concept of, of honest adversity. Now, this is the club wing mannequin, and, which is a, a, a lek bird, another polygynous bird, bird where the female does all the nesting, uh, an aesthetically extreme bird. Right? And, and he is making this very unusual sound. This bird is singing with his wings, right? which is a, a special kind of innovation. Uh, but this example is not just one for innovation. I, I think it shows another thing about the aesthetic, which is that um, uh, the hallmark of agency is um, the capacity to screw it up. Right? And most teenagers are well familiar with this, right? So you should get some freedom and mess it up, right? Well, this is a, about that happening in evolutionary time, right? So this is a really unusual way for a bird to... Uh, I first saw this in, in grad school in 1985, and you can see it took us 20 years to figure out how the hell it works. Uh, this is the work of Kim Bostwick, uh, now also at Cornell. The high-speed movies of this showing the feathers uh, vibrating over the back. These feathers are vibrating at about 100 cycles per second, but the sound is 1,400 cycles per second. So how do they make it? It turns out that the, the club-shaped feathers, the secondary feathers, the ones that are uh, uh, vibrating with the back, uh, uh, have this particular shape. And this blade-like structure on the fifth secondary uh, reaches over and rubs against these bumps. Uh, on the on the on the sixth secondary 
to give like a file and a, and a, and a saw or, 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 or a bow, a violin string and a bow to create a, a mechanical impulse which comes out feather snow. And that's amazing in and of itself. Um, but we're gonna go further. And I, what happens to the body? And what Kim Bostwick showed is that beauty is not only skin deep. In order to create that sound, it had to transform the wing bones and muscles. So here's a CAT scan of a whole specimen showing that the, the wing bones here, the, 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 the humerus, the humerus, the radius, and the radius and the ulna are, are solid. That's a big deal because uh, all birds have hollow wing bones. Heck, even T. rex and velociraptor have hollow ulnas, right? So this is an ancient feature going back prior to the evolution of flight. And yet this has been transformed through sexual selection for the capacity to make those wing songs. And here's a comparison of the ulnas of the uh, clubbing mannequin to other mannequins. And if you were to compare these ulnas of other mannequins, you'd find that they're a lot more like Archaeopteryx, a Jurassic, you know, so uh, proto uh, flying uh, uh, relative of birds. Um, and uh, 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 so this is a, a, a truly uh, big transformation. Clearly, this comes with costs. It's going to affect how they how they how they how they fly, especially since the ulna has been preserved in this tubular, you know, flute shape for so long. Um, but uh, these high costs in the males could just be described as a handicap, another way to try to extend the idea of adaptive signaling, that the costs uh, are, 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 are correlated with the honesty. So in, in, in researching this, I started to ask, well, what about the females? Well, there's a lot of biology here I'm going to gloss over. But just to say, the answer is that the females have the same really weird ulnas. These are the weirdest ulnas of any flying bird. Right? Uh, and she is paying at least some of the costs, but is never going to sing a wing song. Right? So how does this work? Well, I refer to this as the evolution of decadence. Right? Now, the female, by selecting on males that she likes in the song, is going to give rise to uh, 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 the evolution, evolution transformation of the wing bones. But it turns out that bones in birds begin and, and their, their shape development in the embryo before the embryo has become either male or female. And so by transforming male wing bones, she's also transforming the wing bones of her own daughters, who will inherit wing bones that are, make it worse off for them to fly. Right? So in this case, sexual selection, female choice for elaborate wing song has made everybody in the population worse. And why do we know that it's worse? Well, because all other birds have maintained uh, this structure and that, that, that consistency of shape is not about nothing happening. It's about natural selection for flight function to retain that structure. So they're clearly uh, worse off. Right? So uh, these are the kinds of uh, predictions that come out of an aesthetic view uh, with this. So I hope I've convinced you that aesthetic agency uh, is a scientific topic and one we need to grapple with. Right? Um, but this aesthetic view has opened up in my own research a whole nother realm. And this is the very difficult and challenging topic of how agency evolves, or what is the response to sexual coercion and sexual violence in the animal world. And this leads us to the topic of duck sex. Now, I found in my life that duck sex is like a gas. It expands to fill whatever volume uh, you provide for it. So I'm going to try to keep it limited here, or else every question will be about duck sex. <laughs> Most of duck sex is uh, the, 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 of the, of the uh, variety uh, that we understand for birds. Uh, female ducks choose mates on the basis of co-evolved ornamental displays, right? Uh, and so uh, that means there's a lot of beauty in ducks. But uh, ducks also engage in a lot of um, sexually violent and coercive interactions, uh, uh, and often socially oriented. And this problematic topic is, 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 is what we know. What happens when freedom of choice by ducks is infringed by, by, by sexual violence? Um, and this is made possible by the fact that ducks are one of the few birds that retain that still have a penis. The penis evolved in the common ancestor of reptiles and mammals. So the duck penis display here between the legs of this uh, 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 black-bellied whistling duck uh, is homologous with the mammalian and human penis, but very, very different. One of the ways in which they're written, size. So here is the Guinness Book of World Record holder, uh, uh, the uh, Argentine lake duck, which has a penis that is longer than the duck. 
right? And so uh, it, it took Patty Brennan, to, a woman biologist, postdoc, coming to my lab with an interest in duck uh, genitalia uh, to try to ask, well, what is that doing in the female, right? Um, when she proposed this, I thought, well, I've never worked on that end of the bird before. I'm sure I'll learn a lot. But I never realized that what I would learn would transform my view of evolutionary biology and also interact with this other research program on beauty. So uh, a few details about the duck penis. Although it's homologous uh, it, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the mammalian penis, it's very different. It has lymphatic erection. The erection is Im immediate or very rapid. Uh, it's counterclockwise coiled. It doesn't have an enclosed urethra. It has a sulcus, a groove that you see along the main space. Uh, and, uh, and it comes in, in, in smooth, ribbed, uh, uh, thorny, and toothy varieties. Right? Uh, we'll see in, in, in a moment. Uh, now, uh, in science, of course, we aim to change lives. Uh, and the next slide will change your life if you haven't seen a, a duck penis in action. Um, and in fact, uh, for science, no one had until we published this paper in 2010. And this is like common biology available everywhere. So that's a, that's, that's a very notable, interesting thing. So here um, uh, is a high-speed movie of a duck erection um, uh, at, uh, what, 200 frames per second. And so it's soared outside in and comes out. This is, all takes place in a third of a second. And as you can see, uh, the sulcus works just fine. Uh, thank you. I also want to note that uh, we're using the metric side of the ruler. So that uh, will just communicate, this is science, okay? <laughs> you know, it's our units here. So in addition to, uh, to elucidating the biomechanics of the duck penis, which were unknown prior to this uh, research, uh, Patty Brennan discovered a fascinating example of what we call antagonistic coevolution. That is, that there was uh, active evolution going on and coevolution between the, 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 the male penis and the female vaginal morphology. So in species like on the left, where these are dissected uh, uh, genitalia with the male and female, and, and when, you have a, uh, when the species has a low level of forced copulation, that is no sexual violence, the penis is small and the vaginal morphology is simple. But when, on the right, when uh, there's a high frequency of, of sexual coerced copulations, then the female, uh, then the penis gets larger, the surface gets more complicated uh, and armed, uh, and then, but the female evolves a convoluted vaginal morphology. And it's convoluted in a very specific way. The first thing is that there are dead end cul de sacs or pouches. These are off pockets, right? And then above that are a series of clockwise spirals. So female ducks have evolved literally an anti-screw device <laughs> that they can behaviorally uh, deploy in response to sexual violence. Right? And we know that this thing is effective because in species where 40-50% of the copulations are forced, 2-5% to of the offspring in the nets are going to be fathered extra pair. Right? So that means they are 98% successful at eliminating uh, or preventing fertilization from males that they do not prefer, right? This is like an FDA approvable birth uh, control. <laughs> and the question is, how the hell could that happen? Right? Well, we were able to show at least with one uh, assay um, uh, uh, by getting these glass tubes and uh, having ducks erect their penises into glass tubes. And one of the funner parts of the book to write was a chapter about going to the glass blowing shop at uh, <laughs> Yale. Uh, chemistry department telling you we want to make artificial vaginas for ducks. <laughs> and we, we have male-like on the left, female-like on the right, and we show that they fail at very high frequencies. So the bottom line here is that what this means is that sexual autonomy matters to animals. Their uh, freedom of choice is not merely an idea uh, discovered in, in political context by uh, suffragettes and feminists in the 19th, 20th century, but an evolved feature of the social sexual lives of other species. There is something it is like to have freedom of choice, and there are evolutionary consequences to not get. How does this evolve? Well, when the female mates with the male that she prefers, her offspring will inherit genes for those traits that she has preferred, and that other females have co-evolved to share. 
this is the normative, the normative idea of what is attractive in a, in a male or duck or any of the species. But when she is forcibly fertilized, her offspring will inherit either a random trait or one that she specifically rejected, which means that her offspring are less likely to inherit the traits that other females will prefer. So anything she can do, either behaviorally or anatomically, to reinforce her freedom of choice will be rewarded by aesthetic normativity. That is, females, as a group, through their shared taste for the beautiful, can reinforce and advance their own capacity to maintain control over fertilization in the face of sexual violence. Right? So I consider this to be a profoundly feminist discovery in science. Not in the sense that it provides any information about, uh, about uh, human ethics, politics, etc., but to say that the, that the dynamic of, of, uh, of, 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 of human or feminist dialogue or feminist concepts are actually more general than they had realized and apply broadly to other kinds of, 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 of sexual conflict in other ways. Now, in, in, in the case of these ducks, it leads to a relentless uh, arms race. Many species have actually lost this uh, by becoming uh, less dense or, or nesting less densely, eliminating social opportunity for forced copulation. So it's come and gone in many different lineages of ducks. Uh, but it is not, uh, uh, it, 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 it's harmful to the population, everybody's worse off. However, there are other kinds of pathways, and, and, and that leads us to, 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 to bowerbirds and to another kind of aesthetic uh, uh, interaction with uh, eight, between eight aesthetic agency and, and sexual bias or coercion. And, and, and the bowerbirds have a different approach. The bowerbirds are polygynous, like a lot of the guys we've been talking about today. Uh, the female does all the nesting, the males do his plays, and the female chooses among the male males. But bower birds create, a, the males create a novel structure called a bower. Uh, this is a satin bower bird with an avenue bower. It's called an avenue because it has a passageway in the front. And the male makes the bower, they're not a nest. It is a seduction theater. It is a place where the female visits him and he displays. Uh, so usually what will happen is the, male, the female will sit in that spot uh, and look out at, at the male. Now the male also gathers lots of materials. In satin bower birds, it's all about blue. You see he's got a blue feather, but it's also blue garbage, uh, you know, <laughs> straws. And I think photographers bring along blue stuff too. To, and, and so if you go to a, a popular bower, there'll be a lot of blue trash there. Uh, but, um, but they use other species, other things. So this is a great bower bird from Northwest Australia. Uh, and and, and, and uh, uh, this guy is about a kilometer or two from the ocean. And on the ocean is a cliff. And in the middle of the cliff is one stratum. And in those stratum are fossils. Right? And this guy is a, uh, has a pile of fossil clamshells in his So he is a paleontological bowerbird. <laughs> As a museum curator, uh, I feel that I kind of relate to this guy. So he, he, when he's singing in the top of his tree, saying, uh, you know, as they do, to attract females to visit the male, he's actually saying, do you want to come over and see my fossil collection? <laughs> Not a joke. So, so when, when the female comes to visit, he'll be in the front and she's inside. And of course, uh, uh, the, the bowers vary a lot among species, but here we can see this other dimension of bowers. What happens is the male wants to copulate. He has to go around the back of the walls, which gives the female a chance to pop out the front if this is not going in the direction she likes. So the bower is aesthetic. It has evolved in this incredible diversity. And yet it has this other correlated function which is that it protects her from sexual coercion. <coughs> How does it evolve? Well, the males make the bowers, but they make the bowers based on female choice. So females have transformed male display in a way that further their own uh, sexual autonomy. And what do they do with this autonomy? Well, of course, they choose beauty. So they can get as intimate and close for as long as they like to this guy and all his stuff, right? <laughs> and still maintain control. And so what do females do more broadly with their choices? They choose beauty. And so what we see is an, an aesthetic radiation, an explosion in diversity, both in the bower structure and in the diversity of the stuff that they attract. Right? Uh, and so we're now at the point where we have this idea that freedom of choice fosters diversity and beauty in nature. Right? And that is, a, in every sense, a scientific statement. Right? And, and, and that's one. Uh, another reward uh, for, for this uh, aesthetic uh, path in science. So, 
we've been talking about a lot of aesthetically extreme birds here. Uh, I'm going to finish up with birds and then with this. It's, of course, uh, in any aesthetic competition, uh, you know, the prize has got to go to the Brazilian team. Right? <laughs> okay. So here is a, a group of unrelated male mannequins displaying in a cooperative mode. What I want to point out is that the, the female is here. Right? So she is observing, and, uh, and she, she, she can pick any team she wants, but in each team there's only one alpha male, and that's the only guy that will copulate. The female is sexual for about five, ten minutes a year, probably. The males dance in these partnerships all day, all day long, year after year. Some of these partnerships endure for over a decade. What are the un what are the under males doing? They're they're hoping someday to work their way up in the hierarchy and, and inherit the purse so that they then can be compared to other such teams and maybe. So this is the most extreme measured sexual selection in any wild species is in is in this genus, right? Um, so uh, what, what, do we, what do we do with that? Well, uh, David McDonald in a related closely related species that species has shown uh, with male teams that uh, 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 network centrality of young males best predicts the social success of adults. That is uh, what I call bromance before romance, <laughs> right? That is not, a, this is not a hierarchy where it's like how much can you beat up on the other guys just so you're better. The guy who wins in the sexual competition is the guy who is best at dating and creating relations with other males. Right? Now, what, what I think has gone on is that this whole has been shaped by female choice for males that get along. So they, they have transformed, aesthetically remodeled maleness in a way that advances their aesthetic uh, desires. Right? Um, and, and it shows that how powerful female choice can be in this regard. Now, um, uh, I could go in a number of different directions here, but I'm going to finish with uh, in, in recognition of the fact that I'm here with the uh, uh, ur you know, urban humanities, uh, with the humanities. Well, there are lots of different contexts with the sex aesthetic evolution is about sexual attraction, uh, 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 pollination, uh, uh, fruit givery, fruit advertisements, and also uh, nature doesn't just do beauty, uh, the Afro-Semitism, the warning colorations like coral snakes and monarchs and skunks and rattlesnakes are all genres of horror, right, in nature. This is a, uh, uh, you know, flee in terror when you see those things, right? Uh, but I'm going to go back into the cultural. And, uh, you know, uh, when I first started diving into this, I became very interested in aesthetics, and I started reading in it, and, and hope, I really was starting just, I just wanted a couple of references that I could add to my, my discussion. Uh, but indeed, uh, I got hooked, especially by the work of Arthur Danto, who uh, wrote uh, some critical papers in the 60s, particularly analyzing this work, Brillabox, which is uh, aesthetic, uh, essentially identical to a commercial object, and yet this piece created by and Warhol was considered high art and was in the museum. And he was asking, what's the difference? And, and he concluded that the difference was uh, 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 the creation of theories of art, or what created art, was the art world, the population. He also said an amazing statement, suppose one thinks of the discovery of a whole class of art as something analogous to the discovery of a whole new class of facts, anyway, viz, as something for theoreticians to explain. And I was like, okay, well, that, that's the invitation for me. Uh, what about, uh, what about uh, uh, co-evolution? So um, uh, I became uh, fascinated in the idea that I have something to contribute. So I published a paper uh, expanding and extending this co-evolution concept in evolutionary biology to broader, to, to theories of art. In that paper I proposed that art is a form of communication that co-evolves with its evaluation, uh, whether that's by genetic or cultural mechanisms. And that uh, the art is a population phenomenon, as Danto proposed, but that many of those populations are uh, 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 wild species. That many birds, song, plumages, flowers, fruits, uh, electrical songs, and more myriad fishes are art, biotic art. Uh, and that there are myriad, myriad of biotic art worlds. I, I could say a lot here, but I just want to point out with its art history and, and, and modern aesthetics are used to the idea of artworks themselves is transforming what art can be. That each of these revolutionary artworks at some point created a new uh, influence, the concept at, broad, uh, at large of what could actually be and constitute art. Uh, but what I want to propose is that uh, is explicitly an aesthetic theory of art, 
That is, that each one of these is also a transformation of the aesthetic. That the aesthetic includes all of those features and criteria they use for evaluating an artwork, including not just the sensory. So art is not, uh, aesthetics is not just the biological sensory, but every aspect of meaning and, and, and thought. So uh, 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 this framework, uh, uh, I'd love to elaborate, I'm gonna quit now by saying that um, I think this is progressive for an important reason. You know, in cosmology, we began thinking that we were at the center of the universe and that the, everything was revolving around us. And we basically bro broke that down over a whole series of years until we realized that we human beings are basically nowhere still in the universe. Now, uh, that decentering, each one of those phases, expanded our knowledge and changed our position in the globe or in the universe. And, and yet I think that's, um, that only enhances the incredibleness of the experience we're all having here, you know? Materiality and subjectivity, the whole thing, right? Uh, the fact that we come from nowhere is well, supposed to the center of everything that makes what we're experiencing more amazing and what we're able to do more amazing, right? I think the same thing is true in aesthetics. If we take humans out of the organizing center of aesthetics and reframe the problem, we will only enhance our own appreciation for the uniqueness of people. So this post-human aesthetic framework is uh, humanistic in an extraordinary degree, and, 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 I, and I think that um, uh, that's one of the really interesting interdisciplinary, and that's why uh, I would say yes when somebody who was talking about the environmental humanities uh, or uh, urban humanities would. So, um, like cosmology, moving human beings out of the organizing center of the aesthetics enhances our understanding of, of human aesthetics. Post human aesthetics places our unique aesthetic complexity in the context of understanding better, uh, uh, and like, uh, like um, thank you very much for your uh, time and attention, and I look forward to the conversation. Bye.
the establishment of city planning as a discipline. The great um, uh, uh, Scottish city planner, uh, Patrick Geddes, who designed Tel Aviv, amongst other small projects, um, was also a noted evolutionary biologist, producing fundamental works on the evolution of sex. Uh, we tend to, uh, biologists tend to encounter those works, city planners tend to encounter his, his work in city planning and not ever connect the two. Um, one of my favorite connections is uh, uh, the much later between um, uh, the work of the great urbanist uh, Jane Jacobs, who thanks mostly to a hatchet job by uh, Lewis Mumford in, the, in his pages of The New Yorker, uh, and to the fact that uh, her uh, employers at the time where she was a, a contributing editor at Architectural Forum were worried enough about uh, 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 the response by developers to her book, Death Night the Great American Cities, that she neither identified her own professional background nor was uh, um, uh, you know, uh, rewarded for it or, or characterized by it when the book, Death Night the Great American Cities, was published. But not only was she incredibly accomplished as an architecture critic, she actually had, um, uh, while not having a college degree, she had uh, two years of very advanced study at Columbia in um, embryology and evolution um, and, the, uh, um, and the biology of metabolisms, which she brought to great use in Death of Life in Great American Cities, um, in many ways as a larger intellectual framework for the book, and also in the fundamental quality that we saw tonight, which is understanding the world not through a set of preconceived ideas, but through a set of examined specimens, which was the, the precise nature of the biological science she learned there. And in her honor, and also in a, in a kind of um, sympathy for, um, uh, for the idea not only of, um, uh, of aesthetics, but uh, of, of its great, the great bugaboo of, uh, of evolutionary biology in the framework of architecture uh, and city planning, which is the idea of optimization. So um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, if there's one strand, a uh, sort of biological strand of city planning represented by figures like Gettys and Jacobs, there's another strand of uh, what we call, might call mechanistic city planning, which funnily enough, I think was the result of Darwin as well, but it was the result of the great Victorian anxiety at being thrust out of the center of the universe by the historical scale of time that Darwin revealed, um, uh, of not being God's chosen creature, of just being one of many. But at the same time, the way in which technology um, uh, in Victorian Britain provided almost a sense of godlike power. And technology and the kind of optimization of technological systems became a kind of new religion. In, uh, uh, and that carried on through the, um, uh, the work of the Garden City Movement and through the work of, uh, of Le Corbusier, as he took from it, etc., etc. One of the, my favorite passages from Jane Jacobs' Death and Life of Great American Cities, which I will read to you before my one question <laughs> and then before the larger discussion we'll have, is um, Jane Jacobs making a case specifically for the lack of utility, for serendipity, and um, uh, for the delight in, um, uh, uh, in the unexpected that cities can and should provide. She writes, the floor of the building in which this book is being written is occupied also by a health club with a gym, a firm of ecclesiastical decorators, an insurgent Democratic Party reform club, a Liberal Party political club, a music society, an accordionist, accordionist association, a retired importer who sells mate by mail, a man who sells paper and also takes care of shipping the mate, a dental laboratory, a studio for watercolor lessons, and a maker of costume jewelry. Amongst the tenants who were here and had gone shortly before I came in, were a man who rented out tuxedos, a union local, and a Haitian dance troupe. There is no place, she writes, for the likes of us in new construction, and the last thing we need is new construction. In a forceful footnote, she adds further, no, the last thing we need is some paternalist weighing whether we are sufficiently non-controversial to be admitted to subsidized quarters in the utopian dream city, of course, the optimized mechanistic landscape of which Corbusier dreamed. All right, that said, um, uh, writing many years before that, the uh, Roman architectural historian um, uh, Vitruvius uh, outlined the nature of architecture, which I would argue is a, maybe a better even corollary aesthetic framework for um, uh, uh, than, than the pure art world, um, three qualities. Um, uh, they're often translated as commodity, firmness, and delight, but in the original Latin they are firmitas, utilitas, two very conventional masculine uh, sensibilities, <coughs> And Venustas, which is the quality of Venus, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, translated as delight, but is precisely that which is not functional, 
which is not utilitarian, but makes the thing worthwhile. Um, and that is also, in some ways, uh, Jacob's point. And so, in some ways, though, the, the, I think the, the history of architecture also has precisely uh, uh, qualities like your descriptions, wonderful de de descriptions of the transformation of dinosaur decorations into functional wing feathers, of uh, qualities that have slipped back and forth between these three spheres. Um, uh, so um, one of my favorite examples, also re uh, relating to Victorian Britain, is that um, in many ways, Victorian Britain was late in, uh, 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 in picking up uh, the idea of a purely functional aesthetic for buildings, because it turned out the richly ornamented aesthetics of um, uh, 19th century stonework were also very effective at, at uh, uh, masking the uh, effects of industrialization on buildings, all the soot and grime and, and that all worked its way into the crevices and actually brought out the ornamentation of the building. It had a kind of functional role. Um, and the history of architecture is full of such switches and flips, as is um, uh, the history of evolution. And so my last, uh, I feel completely unqualified as an architect talking about evolution. And so my last citation will be uh, an evolutionary biologist talking about architecture, which is, um, of course, Stephen Jay Gould, who, in his great history of kind of borrowing uh, and, and uh, his own takedown of what I think you also call it the, the Panglossian paradigm of adaptationism, yeah. talked about the way in which something like the a pendentive in the Cathedral of San Marco, which he mis misidentifies as a, as a spandrel, uh, is, you know, has, serves a, a dumb functional quality, but is used for the painting of ornamental, for ornamental paintings of angels. And it would be a misunderstanding to say that it, it evolved. And in some ways, my only sort of question to you is, is how would you contextualize, I think in, in, in your forceful um, uh, pushback against your own discipline, my only concern is that you might give us the, 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 the experience, as is often mistakenly the case in architecture, that beauty is somehow a thing unto itself that a building first does these, as Vitruvius would say, all these functional things, and then covers itself, as, as uh, Venturi would have called it, dec a decorated shed versus a duck, yeah, which yeah. he called, which is a, a, a kind of uh, a beautifully shaped building. So how would you, having pushed back and, and, uh, against your own discipline and created the sphere of the beautiful, how would you, would, would you then teach us as, as architects and practitioners about its integration with the utilitarian and functional, both yeah. in evolutionary time and in our own practices? That's my only question. Okay. <laughs> Long <laughs> finish. <laughs> I should have taken notes, because that was yeah. a lot of fun stuff. Um, uh, uh, interestingly, I, I, well, I, I glossed over a, a lot here quickly, yeah. but um, you know, really there are um, uh, aesthetic components of the phenotype. It, indeed, the, the comparison between ornithology and architecture is maybe the best of all the arts because uh, most of architecture is about uh, physical objects that at least you have to be able to walk into or interact with. Or hopefully they keep out the rain uh, 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 yeah. and, and, and you can put in some plumbing if you're yeah. lucky, right? Yeah. And, and so, they, but birds have plumbing too. You know, they right. have to do stuff. And so these challenges are inherent or part of every, of yeah. every, of every, of every bird. Um, so, um, uh, I think that this kind of decadence is an example where, um, you, you, like certain styles of architecture, may also have encountered. Well, you know, they wanted to use this material because they liked it, but it was a really bad idea, and so now the building's not lasting. Or, et cetera, right? These are uh, uh, costs, deadening costs of, of, of aesthetic expression, and 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 I, I think those occur. I think that that there's, in, in theory, we we have done some population genetic theory, and in fact. That there's nothing to prevent, in theory, this from leading to extinction, uh, which is disturbing to a lot of uh, evolutionary biologists. But then, uh, you know, if the, all these uh, decadent birds were already extinct, we we wouldn't know <laughs> that they had gone extinct because they were too decadent. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, some of these birds' paradise are legitimately rare. They may be a case of, uh, of true loss. Um, however, in all these cases, uh, the ornaments, uh, and I use that word. Uh, in, ornithology because um, the, the bird is more than just a piece of art uh, or had, than, than having artworks or, or being aesthetic objects, entities. It is a functioning organism that has lots of parts that are not shaped at all by aesthetic selection. Yeah. And so, um, um, uh, you know, the alma of the, of the, of the club of mannequin is a great example of this compromise between, between uh, functional and, 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 and 
these set of demands on the internal structure when you can't see, like what would happen to the beams inside the building uh, as a result of these things. Um, and uh, clearly, that's a great example of a straight up compromise right there. Um, but members uh, have to uh, you know, uh, migrate thousands of miles into the winter. So uh, uh, they have both to uh, function beautifully as well as function sexually. And, and what I'd like to point out is, is that um, um, this, the importance of sexual selection doesn't eliminate natural selection, but just say that uh, organisms have to be successful. They have to be successful in both these challenges. Uh, if you're too, uh, uh, if you're uh, uh, perfectly, uh, survive perfectly well, you're perfectly fit, but you're not uh, ornamented appropriately to gain uh, uh, mates, then your genes are not passed on. But if you're so beautiful uh, that you're optimally beautiful, but you can't live long enough to benefit from it, then your genes don't go forward. You got you got they have to win both of these or uh, compete in both of these arenas to, to succeed. And I think buildings are a lot like that too. So I'm now going to be incredibly hypocritical, which is to say that I preceded my question with an incredibly long explanation, far too verbose for all of your attention. But I'm going to uh, invite, uh, open the floor to questions and ask you very precisely not to do the same, which is to say, <laughs> to, to keep your questions short and brief uh, uh, to allow Richard to, uh, to respond to them. So I think we have a, a microphone, uh, uh, and if you can wait for the microphone to come to you, it helps all of our recorded folks. And we have a question all the way, first question all the way in the back. And I'm pretty hard of hearing, so you'll have to really uh, speak up for me to uh, catch you. Thank you. Um, thank you for very much for the presentation. I'm very excited because I'm writing a thesis on the biological language of architecture. And my question is, um, how this criteria of the women in selecting the male birds, how is it created? Like, why, like, how that criteria to select happens? Is it due yeah. to exposure to things that are pleasurable for the women, like fruits and nature and parts of the nature that actually help them survive, so they get exposed to pleasurable inputs, and then when they see those inputs in the male, they will also... Yeah. Well, it, or, or is it something it, genetical, or where is that? Yeah, so I think... I, I do think this is a genetic in, in, in bowerbirds, right? Uh, it has long history and consistency. These architectures are shared by clays that are uh, several millions of years old, at least, right? So they, and they, and they diversify. Uh, so they have history, which I think is quite genetic. We haven't done the experiments of depriving uh, bowerbirds and raising them in captivity without other cult, without other influences to see what kind of bowers they make. Uh, so that has not been done. Uh, but. Um, uh, how this gets started? Well, there, first of all, there's an ancient history of mate choice in birds. All birds uh, are showing mate choice. So they already have criteria uh, by which they're, they're selecting their mates. Um, there are some bowers that, that are monogamous, right, where the male uh, is at the nest, right? So that's the sister group to the rest of the family. So we know how they started the regular old family life that we see in most birds, uh, where, where mate choices are being made. Um, then there are there's one bowerbird, uh, the tooth-billed bowerbird, that actually uh, builds an arena without a bower. And this is interesting because there's a lot of diversity, but this diversity has, uh, in some ways, captured this transitional moment. Even though it's it's a, a extinct species, it's not an ancestor, but it has. A, and so what happens in this species is that the male has an arena that's about a, a, a yard wide, and in that arena he displays green leaves. Uh, that are either upside down or and they're just uh, and they're sort of, and they're all spaced. They're, it's quite, uh, they're not piled up, they're, they're separate. And they're kept green. If they wilt, he gets a new one, right? Uh, so when the female visits, though, she will hear him singing, which they sing a lot. And when she comes down to the, to the, to the court, he copulates immediately. So she has three seconds to, and she can't get any closer to him, right? So in this case, uh, in the absence of a bowel, we know the copulation happens immediately, and that she cannot scrutinize him a lot, very well, right? So, um, uh, and so we can see that uh, the collection of materials occurred first before the architecture, the, 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 the ornament, the little objects, and that uh, somehow through selection on some variation, 
that was architectural, that provided her with a refuge, uh, she did this elaborate. There's another kind of bower I skipped over. There's a maple bower, where there's a central, sort of like a Charlie Brown Christmas tree sort of thing, you know? And the, and the, and the, and the birds go around the sides. So it's basically uh, like this, where the female keeps the male on the opposite side. Uh, and so if he comes around, she jump up. So she could, she should kind of see him around, and, 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 and so that's the, that's the way that works. So we have two very different kinds of architecture that have elaborated. They both have the same, the same function. We've also done population genetic models, uh, not published, but we have a model that shows that this can happen, or that it's uh, you know, genetically plausible as well. Great, next, next question. Uh, uh, up here, and then in the front, and then we'll go all the way back to the back. Speak up and we'll repeat the question so everyone can hear. This question might be less fun, but I think so. I want to go back to what you were saying about the comparison between the co evolution of the aesthetic choices among choice within birds to the art world. And I, I follow this sort of a, a co evolved evaluation. I think that the, that the uh, um, well, it's, 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 it's quite clear I'm willing to take it very far, <laughs> uh, beyond the level of analogy, to, to talk about these are processes that deserve the same name, aesthetic, uh, and, that, and that we gain uh, uh, in both fields by, by going that far. Uh, however, there are, there are differences between genetic mechanisms and cultural mechanisms of inheritance. I think that this is just another richness to the diversity of the ontology of art that we already have uh, a, a huge, interesting challenges uh, dealing with. Um, it, you know, uh, it seems like it'd be ridiculous to imagine such excess happening in nature, uh, but in fact, um, you know, if most uh, reproductive success in birds has to do with whether a snake eats your nest, and that snake eating your nest is irrelevant to whatever kind of mate choice you made, uh, the individuals that survived still had to have a dad, that, and that, that, that there still had to be a mate choice uh, being made. And so uh, there's lots of opportunity for there to be strong se natural selection, and have sexual selection be also be strong and also be independent from natural selection. Uh, the idea that um, you know we're all going to die, but that doesn't mean we're under natural selection. Right? You got to show that. And, it, and and in this case, uh, you know, all these birds are going to have mate choices, and they, they're likely to. Uh, um, uh, or in many cases, there are many of these choices like to be independent of, uh, of, of, of natural selection. So although it sounds uh, odd and against what we think of as the economy of nature, I, I, I think uh, you know, uh, there's lots of reason to think that it, it, it should be common. Certainly in animals like birds that have you know, subjective experience, opportunity for choice, and, and cognitive evaluation. Okay. Uh, uh, next question up here at the front. Okay. Okay. So just stand up and, and shout out. Yeah. Yeah. I took an art history class, so I learned what's beautiful. I wonder, <laughs> are, there, are there any cases where it's really clear that birds learned what's beautiful, it's cultural, and not just genetic? Absolutely, and this is a fascinating thing that I couldn't shoot on into this so book. The, the um, question, sorry, just in case people in the back didn't hear it, the, the, uh, uh, the questioner learned what was beautiful in an art history class. He pointed out, um, as, as did a lot of us. And the, the and the question is whether there are examples of uh, of, of learned beauty or aesthetics uh, uh, in the natural world. Yeah. So uh, approximately half of the species of birds in the world learn their songs from other individuals of that species that are not their parents. What's the evidence? Oh, I mean, it's, a, 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 it's 
extraordinarily rich you, uh, and, and, and a lack of things. Yeah, yeah, so so, uh, uh, so uh, it, it opened up a, a, a field guide, everything from swallows to sparrows, uh, Ossian pastor and birds, that right there is 4,000 species of birds, they all learn their songs. So they have been doing learning, and which gives rise to dialects and culture, um, for over 30, 40 million years, right? Uh, and it's, it's a, a fascinating riches. The other groups that learn are parrots, Parrots can learn poly wine and cracker because they're learning in their own lives out in the, out in the wild. Um, and uh, hummingbirds, and then uh, one of the genus of, of cotingas called that, that one, this guy. Yeah, yeah, that guy, that guy, that, that guy is an independent origin of learning one of only seven uh, acoustic learners in, in uh, lineages in, in, in nature. Um, so, so it's overwhelmingly cultural, and that's a, that's a fascinating thing. So that means that ornithology as a discipline has to grapple with the same level of complexity as the humanities, which includes both enormous cultural and biological ecosystem. And that's a, one of the reasons why I think, uh, well, I don't think ornithology does it well yet, but I, I aspire to uh, both ornithology and humanities both doing that better. There is a very patient question all the way in the back, and then we'll come to the middle. Yeah, well, you know, Eros, uh, 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 sexual choice is one of the greatest, most abundant in the natural world ways to get uh, sensory, you know, sensory perception, cognitive evaluation, and choice. And so, and, 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 uh, and that's been a big part of my research, and that's why that's prominent here. Uh, however, I, you know, uh, 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 there are many other interactions where animals are choosing on the basis of sensory perception and what it is that they like, their subjective response to those things. So, for example, pollination, uh, which is lots of organisms, uh, age, you know, bees and butterflies and birds uh, and bats, um, they are uh, about, they are perceiving, they are evaluating, and they're making decisions. Do I feed here or over here? Now, it's very popular, and again, in science, to reduce that interaction to a kind of sensory exploitation. That the flower uh, uh, is somehow pushing the bees' buttons so that the bees can't help itself. It's forced to feed. However, if that were true, all flowers would converge on pounding on this one button, the one way to get that bee to come to you. But of course, that would defeat the purpose of the flower, because the flower wants you to take its pollen to another individual of the same species. So flowers evolve to be memorably rewarding. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and that is true of fruits as well. So that's a, a whole large and very diverse set of, 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 of uh, I've called genres, of interactions between, between other. Now, it is about sex for the plant. Uh, but it's not about sex for the bee. Uh, so I think it's quite clear that bees are making choices. If, if, and the world looks a certain way, beautiful, flowers look beautiful and, 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 and smell beautiful because bees are making choices, right? Uh, and, and, and so I think that agency extends down to there. Um, other genres include, as I was talking about, you know, genres of horror. You know, the coral snake evolves to be uh, uh, um, uh, brightly colored to advertise its, its noxious and venomous condition, as do rattlesnakes and, and, and snakes and bees uh, and uh, you know, lots of different creatures. And that's an example of, of, of a coral ball state. You know, a rattlesnake or coral snake patterns are, 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 uh, are uh, naturally, are, are, uh, uh, young chicks, even domestic chicks that grow up, they're automatically afraid of them, right? So they have coral ball. To some extent, um, and so uh, there, I think there are lots of uh, uh, places where aesthetic uh, uh, evolves. And, is, and one of the other things that is, is, in many cases, we have situations like mimicry. Mimicry in the natural world is analogous, an identical process to forgery in the art world, right? Where you have an advantage and you get somebody scamming on it. And, and, and just like forgery in our world, if the for, if the frauds become too common, that degrades the whole art world and, 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 and the economy of that art will collapse, right? Uh, and and, and there, so uh, that, 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 that can happen in nature as well. So uh, lo lots of different contexts in which this can happen. I, 
I would only uh, add that, the, the, yes, forgery happens, but I, I would argue that that's a much larger dynamic because, you know, um, uh, Steve Jobs quoted Pablo Picasso as saying, good artists borrow and great artists steal. And it turns out to have been a quote from T.S. Eliot. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the point being that all kinds of human, uh, 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 there is a, a within both art and architecture, uh, more broadly, there's a kind of illusion or culture of, uh, of inspiration that I would relate to the illusion or culture of optimization in, in other realms of design. Whereas in fact, uh, what, we, what we really encounter is, a, is an enormous amount of, bar of not just borrowing, but stealing is just borrowing something, but permanently. Yeah, well, that, it's interesting to note that, that, as far as I'm concerned, many of those objects that the, um, that the Bowerbirds are gathering as part of their artwork are in themselves already artworks. That those flowers, those fruits, those, those ornamental feathers were, in their original context, co-evolved with choices already. Right? So this is a collage. Uh, and and, and, and uh, there are other cases, there are many birds whose uh, have evolved to expand their own vocal repertoires by learning the songs of other species. So mockingbird and a whole and a whole host of different species. And 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 uh, there's a fantastic case where uh, a marsh warbler in Europe, which winters in sub-Saharan Africa, and then goes up to Sweden, Denmark, etc., and and is singing song repertoires that include African resident species. So they're they're grabbing pieces of culture out of Uganda and bringing them and singing them in Sweden where the sun never sets. <laughs> right? It's and, not and, so and different from the Beatles. Yeah. And, 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 and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of you know, intercontinental uh, cultural uh, uh, you know, collage. And, and what's fascinating is, uh, you know, we don't know, uh, but uh, what, does this provide information to the females? Because the females have preferences. They spent the winter in Uganda too. Is this like, you know, remember spring break? <laughs> we, I mean, that's ridiculous. And yet, uh, we don't know if nostalgia, you know, so is actually an experience that birds can have. Right? Um, that shows a, 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 the complexity of the, you know, art world appropriation, uh, uh, multiple cultures, cultural interaction, uh, and intercontinental uh, interactions and, uh, and borders. Sex, all in one example. And thanks. There's a question in the middle of the room. You can have your hand up for a while. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, Rick, thank you so much um, for your work, for your book. Uh, from the point of view of biology, there's so much to say about it, but from the point of view of biology, a few, a few questions, I guess. You, um, you provide a lot of liberation. Book is 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 is, is uh, part of a larger series of critiques of uh, of 20th century evolutionary biology, especially uh, what biologists call the new synthesis, which was a certain way of combining uh, uh, population genetics with, uh, uh, and, with and evolution and, and diversity. Um, and there, that that critique has been going on for a long time. Very serious. You know, Stephen Gould, why this errors are, are exactly you know similar sorts of. But, 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 but sexual selection and matrix has been mostly outside of that. So I'm uh, hoping to open up a new, a, new, a new front in this discussion. Of course, it's reminiscent of lots of other similar things. But I see phylogenetics and evo gibo development and evolutionary biology as other similar uh, uh, critiques. Um, I guess I'm... Uh, I'm doing this in hopes of trying to, I, I wrote a popular book uh, because of my uh, uh, dry science papers were not really doing it for me. <laughs> Nobody, no, the field was not changing. And I got impatient 
And so I wanted to start uh, broadening the conversation and invite other uh, voices and readers and maybe destabilize science from the outside. Uh, so I think some of these people in the 70s days actually did this, uh, you know, Gould and Dawkins, uh, and more recently, uh, Pinker, Dennett, Diamond, these folks have all done this, and, uh, and, and Lynn Margulis. Lots of people have reached outside and, 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 and appealed to uh, other areas, and, and so that's the, those are the, that's the mode of the book. just seeing more extensive colors. It's actually a new dimension to their color perception. So uh, we can imagine uh, our color perceptions in a flat triangle, right? Uh, uh, but the avian color world is, is tetrahedral. And that tetrahedral uh, ultraviolet dimension in, it describes a whole series of colors you can't imagine, like ultraviolet yellow and ultraviolet green which are as different from uh, uh, yellow and green as purple is from red. Because purple is our own example of a chimeric non, a mixture of non-adjacent colors in the spectrum, right? So um, we know that birds see them, and we know that they use them, and they evolve them in their plumage, right? Uh, but we can't see them, and we never will, right? Uh, there's no way to genetically engineer a human to get their, you know, they, they get the oil droplets back in there, that's all this stuff, we, we can't get there. And so uh, really what we have to do is create a color science uh, for the birds and try to study it mathematically. And, then we're, and those are interesting tools, there will be lots of space for more psychological uh, work on bird vision, uh, and, and, and a plug, uh, I, yeah, well, I, I know there's some great work in review or in preparation that, that does exactly this. Uh, so we, uh, we know that these birds are seeing and evaluating, can learn these colors. Uh, so that's the tip of the iceberg uh, uh, and, and, and for, for, uh, for this. And what's interesting, people think, why am I, you know, there's no cure for color blindness, you know, uh, currently. And so as a result, you know, we, 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 we can't become avian. But it is notable to know that birds um, uh, can tell who's wearing sunblock. Not only is that gull flying above you on the beach, but he can tell who's wearing sunblock because sunblock is a UV absorbing pigment, uh, and uh, uh, and they can see that you know whose skin is reflecting UV in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the normal way. Right? Uh, so so that's a way to you know earn, 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 earn respect for for bird uh, bird color vision. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>